You know, there were times when um, I just thought of myself as being a man. That's why I drank. I thought, you know, this is this is something that is perpetuating that thing within myself. You know, that core part of myself. Um, it's what is um, is holding up my ego, if you like. Um, I'm Kevin O'Hara for AlcoholMastery.com and HabitsUnplugged.com. If you uh, are looking to stop drinking alcohol, um, you might click on the subscribe button to subscribe to the channel. Click on the like button if you like this video. And we've also got a link down below um, for a book, our 10 steps to stop drinking alcohol from Habits Unplugged. Um, you have to download that and have a read of it. There's a lot of good stuff in there to, to help you out. So this is, is basically, I think, a lot of misconceptions about um, manly alcohol use and being a man. Uh, you know, and I'm not suggesting that men should stop being men. I think there's way too much of that these days, you know, trying to um, <laughs> close the sexes or whatever is happening. I don't know. I don't understand half of it. But um, for me, I will always try to be who I am. And part of that is, is being a man. Right, so, um, but I think there's a big difference in doing stuff which upholds your manly virtues and manly values, and being a man um, in terms of what other people think you should be, because that's all going to depend on the crowd that you're with. You know, like I said, I, I thought I was being a man when I was drinking. I did a lot of what I considered to be manly things. When I started drinking first, I drank because I wanted to become a man. And I was only 12 years of age. You know, imagine that myself and a mate of mine in the back, we'd built this manly man cave in the back of our garden. And it was made out of old pallets, you know, uh, bits of scrap wood. Uh, it was sort of, um, yeah, ramshackle thing. I'm surprised we didn't kill ourselves making the thing. But anyway, the two of us managed to, we went up to the, the local pub, we managed to get some money from somewhere. And we waited outside this pub until uh, we asked a couple of people before um, and they wouldn't do it. But eventually we got this old guy, said, can you go in and get us, you know, a six pack of, I think it was Smithics that we wanted. Um, we didn't know what we were asking for. I think, I'm sure it was because his father, my father never drank that stuff, but uh, his father must have drank it. Anyway. The guy comes in, brings us out this uh, plastic bag with a six pack of these little stub bottles in it and we snuck them into this thing and drank it. But that's the reason why I did it, you know, and it tasted horrible, I didn't like it, but it, you know, the, the motivation was there to become or to be a man and to, to feel myself as being a man. So there you go, that's what I did. I started smoking even earlier because of that same thing, you know, I mean, cigarettes were a lot more accessible. We could go down to our local shop when I was a kid and they would sell you single cigarettes. So they'd open a packet of cigarettes and sell you a single cigarette for a penny or two pennies or something like that. I can't remember exactly how much it was, but you know, it's for nothing. Um, and it was only really to encourage kids to buy cigarettes. That's the only reason they were doing it. It was illegal. They couldn't do it. They weren't supposed to do it, but there you go. Um, I think it's one of the reasons why this is perpetuated drinking and smoking, that culture. Uh, eating a lot of red meat is the same thing. It's considered to be a manly thing to do, you know. Um, lots of drugs. I mean, I took lots of different drugs. I mean, I'm not saying that that's the only reason to do it. There are other reasons. There are other motivations for uh, <laughs> surrounding this, but it's one of the big ones. Um, you know, I, I, I've s smoked a lot of uh, marijuana, uh, hashish mainly. Um, I've taken speed, I've taken ecstasy, I've taken acid, which I hated. Uh, I've taken coke. I've taken, um, when I was younger, I used to sniff gas out of a bottle. I mean, ridiculous when I think about it. You know, like a, uh, something that you fill your lighter with, you know, the thing that you light your cigarettes with. I can still remember the feeling of it going down my throat, um, you know, and just ridiculous. I'm not sure if that was anything to do with being a man, but it just that came to my mind. I haven't thought about that in years. Um, but it's one of those things that 
you know, we look after ourselves on the outside. I mean, the manly thing to do is to build muscles, but not take too much care about the inside, and certainly not to take any care of your of your mind and building um, the infrastructure and the foundations that are going to help you to make good decisions and choices in your life. You know, this is important. You know, if you if you study and you're you're, you're seen as being a student. You're seen as being weak-minded and um, uh, a nerd. You know, there's there's a certain um, uh, what would you call it? I can't remember. <laughs> you know, there's there's a a chance that you're going to get bullied. I mean, I was never bullied in school because I, I was six foot by the time I was twelve. So. Um, I mean, once or twice, but not very often. Um, but like I say, it's, it's about this, it's about looking after yourself in the short term and looking after those, what you think are your needs in the short term rather than looking after the long-term needs. Now, the reality is that alcohol drinking, um, drugging it up, smoking, bad diet, these things are always, uh, they're always detrimental to you physically. I mean, and you don't notice it when you're a kid. You know, when you're 21 years of age, 22, you know, when you're in your early 20s, it, it, you don't see it because you think, you don't think along those times, uh, along those lines of, of, um, of, I am immortal. I'm, you know, what I'm doing here is, may not be absolutely the best thing that I can do for myself. Um, you don't think about uh, later on in life. And I think as you get experience and you see other people as they get into, especially the later years of their life and you see, um, and understand, I think more importantly, how they are suffering and what they're going through. And then you start to cop on and you start to think, well, the reason why you're, you're going through this, I mean, I saw my father going through this. Um, the reason why you're going through this, the heart problems, the, the, the overweightness, the, um, you know, he had a lot of problems with the different organs in his body by the time he went. And it was because of lifestyle choices. And you see that time and time and time again. It's self-inflicted um, reduction of the quality in your life. And not only in the quality of your physical life, the quality of your mental life as well. You know, you're gonna, you're gonna see things from a much different perspective when you're pissed off, you're depressed, you're, you're, you're angry at life, you're angry at yourself for having done that. I mean, a lot of people push that down, the anger at themselves because they, they, they don't want to look at that, you know, they don't want to see that, that it's them that's done it to themselves. They want to blame something else. They want to blame the education that they got or oh, whatever, you know. And there's a responsibility there, of course, but the major responsibility lies with, with, um, with you. So, um, you know, this, this tough guy image is, is just badly, badly flawed. Uh, it was totally against everything that I wanted in my life. I always wanted to be a writer from a young age. I wanted to be a reader and I wanted to write. Um, I remember thinking when I was a teenager, I wanted to be one of the youngest uh, novel writers around, you know. And I never got a chance to do that because of myself and my, old, my own actions. So instead of doing that, I, I started living this aimless, um, misdirected life uh, or undirected life, I think. You know, it was misdirected in certain ways, but it was a, a certain parts I just didn't care, you know. It was like, I'm living the life that I want to live. I'm doing the things that I want to do. Immediate, instant gratification instead of forward thinking. So it's a careless life. Like I say, you don't, you don't think about these things when you're young, you know. It's like, I think it, it's like leaving the tap on of your life when you're young and you don't notice that your life is flowing away down the drain rather than achieving something. Yeah. So, and then you get to a point where you cop on, thankfully, hopefully you cop on. I did um, eight years, nine years ago now. And I think I started copying on before that. You know, I, I started, I think it's a gradual process where you start seeing um, concrete examples of your own downfall of the consequences of your previous actions. And then you start making decisions and it's usually in, in small ways first. And then you realize that you can make changes and 
you try to make the ch big changes, or I did, and I, I found that those big changes weren't really within my grasp because I didn't have the the, the built-in um, resilience to do it. I didn't have the the the, the will power, if you like. You know the. I didn't have that self-control, you know, so I'd last a, a, a few days without cigarettes. I never tried to, to quit drinking. I mean, moderation was a different thing, but with cigarettes, it was a, it was a you know, I, I found out early enough that I didn't want to do this anymore, but I couldn't stop. Um, you know, I'd stopped for a few days and then all of a sudden that was it. I think the most I ever stopped was maybe two or three months. Um, but then, you know, as well as the, the lack of willpower, you've also got, you're fighting against your own propaganda, like I said, this misconceptions of being a man. So you think, you know, you see the guys with the cigarette hanging out of their mouths and you think, doesn't that guy look so cool? You know, Humphrey Bogart, John Wayne, bless him, you know, he died of cancer. Um, Steve McQueen, another guy who died of, of cancer. Uh, I remember reading a story about Steve McQueen that the, the final months of his life was spent in desperation trying to find a cure. Uh, he went down to Mexico and he went all over the place looking for, trying to find a cure for himself, but never found it. Um, but, you know, it's bad decisions, bad choices. Um, you know, those bad decisions, the bad choices lead to uh, more bad thinking, bad actions, which lead around again to more bad decisions and more bad choices. Um, I'm, more than anything else, it's opportunities lost. You know, that there is a certain potential in everyone. Uh, you know, I think I'm all for equality of opportunity in life. I think equality of outcome is impossible, but equality of opportunity is, is there for everyone. You know, you've got, the, you've got a lot of opportunities there. Um, there is a lot of opportunities to get to the potential that you, you can get. And no matter where you are now, what age you are, you can still get to that to that stage. Um, I was thinking we're watching the, the, the snooker world championships. It's supposed to be on in March, but now it's because of the COVID, it's on in August. And I always remember the world champion at the time, just going back maybe 20 years. I think Sean was only a, a kid at the time. And there was a, a pool tournament in our local pub and the, the winner got to play against, to play a frame of snooker, one frame of snooker with the then world champion who was um, Ken Doherty. And um, I remember playing this, this pool and drinking at the same time. And there was a delay of some kind for two or three hours between the semi-final and the final. And I got into the final um, of this pool competition. You know, it shows you where I spent a lot of my time, you know, down the pub. But got into this pool competition, two or three, four hours wait, I can't remember exactly how long. But instead of going out and coming back again, I decided, no, I'm gonna stay and I'm gonna drink. And by the time the, the, the final came around, I couldn't see the balls, you know, I could see three balls in front of me every, you know, for every single ball that was there. So um, I lost and I lost the opportunity of doing something. I, I, you know, this is a small little thing, but it's something that sticks in my mind as, as, uh, as something very visceral that, um, I could have done this, you know, I always wanted to be a snooker player, but again, alcohol stood in my way, you know, instead of um, making a choice and doing certain things, but yeah, you know, that's in the past. So when I think of all the things that I've done in my life, the work that I've lost, you know, the relationships that I've bungled up, the, the things that I've fucked up because of alcohol, um, it's just, it's amazing. So look, reason over emotion has to be the way that you live your life. You can't go around living your life based around what you are emotionally feeling. You have to think about the things that you're feeling and if those emotions are appropriate, then go by those, you know, otherwise there's, no, there's not much point in doing it. So um, it, it, it's just what, you know, for me, I think if, if I could go back to myself, to my younger days um, with the brain that I have, I know everyone says that, wouldn't it be wonderful, you know? but you can't, so all you can do is travel on with the, the, the mind that you've got and try, and try to educate yourself um, and to live up to the potential that you have. Like I say, everyone has, has, um, has still got that potential. Um, 
but live for yourself. I mean, this is, this is not a time to be living for other people. You know, if you want to get to where you want to go, you've got to think about yourself as the primary. That's your primary motivation, because if you do that, you will be in a much better um, place for uh, helping other people, for dealing with other people. Imagine me trying to do this as a drinker. Imagine me trying to teach anyone anything as a drinker, you know, just impossible. Uh, so anyway, look, uh, if you are ready to get some help stopping drinking alcohol, there's a book that you can download. Um, it's called Habits Unplugged, 10 Steps to Stop Drinking Alcohol. I was talking about it at the beginning, but you have to, as I say, download it and open it up and look at it. You know, read those chapters because each one of those chapters has got something important in there which will hopefully change your mind a little bit and um, allow you to see things from a different perspective. Take care of yourself and uh, I'll speak to you again soon. Uh, keep the alcohol out of your mouth. Almonds and upwards. Bye now.